Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're going to look at particles and antiparticles which is part of the particles and radiation topic in AQA A-level physics. So in today's lesson we're going to try to determine the properties of particles and antiparticles. So if we're being successful and we've learned in today's lesson we can define what antimatter and antiparticles are. We can recall the properties of antimatter and antiparticles and describe what happens when a particle and antiparticle meet which falls in the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification, particles, antiparticles and photons. So antiparticles are like mirror images of particles. A particle can be described in terms of its charge, its mass, its baryon number, its lepton number and its strangeness. Now antiparticles have the same rest mass as particles but have completely opposite all other properties. Now the notation we use for a particle and antiparticle is the following. If the particle was named X then the antiparticle would be named X hat. So for example a proton is P and the antiproton is P hat. Now the first antiparticles were actually observed in the 1920s. Now most antiparticles go by the name of the prefix anti in front of them like the antiproton, the antineutron. The only exception to this is the antiparticle of the electron which we call the positron. So to clarify all particles have the same rest mass and rest energy but completely opposite all other properties compared to the particle counterpart. So let's consider some matter and some antimatter, a proton and an antiproton. So you'll notice between the proton and the antiproton, they have the same rest mass, but they have opposite charge, opposite baryon number, opposite lepton number, and opposite strangeness. So to clarify, the particle and antiparticle have the same rest mass and rest energy, but every other particle property is reversed for the antiparticle. So this can include charge, baryon number, lepton number, and strangeness. Now Einstein had shown that the mass of a particle increases the faster it travels. So when a particle is not moving, it has a rest mass, which is the minimum mass possible. But if you have a particle moving, it has a larger mass, which you call the a relativistic mass. So it's the rest mass plus an extra amount of mass. So this indicates there's a fundamental link between the energy store of an object and its mass. Now this is important because Einstein indicated that the rest mass of a particle corresponds to the rest energy of the particle. Now the rest energy must be considered in the conservation of energy. Now this effect would not be noticeable on the scale of humans but would be noticeable on the scale of particles. So Einstein postulated that the rest mass of a particle particle when it is stationary corresponds to the rest energy locked up as mass. So in all decays and in all situations involving particles, rest energy mass must always be conserved. So in any particle event, the value of the total energy mass remains constant. So this indicated with the equation E equals mc squared, where c is the speed of light squared. Now Paul Dirac predicted the existence of antimatter which could unlock this rest energy whenever a particle and corresponding antiparticle met so they would annihilate and release this energy into the universe. So it had been realised on a quantum scale, the scale smaller than subatomic particles, there's a constant flow between matter and energy through the events of annihilation and pair production. So energy and matter constantly interchange with each other. Now as humans we're oblivious to this process as it happens on a scale much smaller than our senses can detect. So this constant cycling between the forms of energy and matter on the quantum quantum scale is known as the quantum foam. So the processes of annihilation and pair production have a profound consequence on the composition of the universe. So let's consider annihilation. Now, annihilation occurs when a particle meets its antiparticle. The particle and antiparticle are attracted to each other due to the electromagnetic force because opposite charges attract, so they'll proceed to annihilate each other. So at this point, the matter turns into energy and we observe this energy as two photons. Now, there are two photons produced because momentum has to be conserved. Beforehand, the momentum is zero because the particle and antiparticle are moving in opposite directions so cancel each other's momentum out. So afterwards we need to have a zero momentum to conserve this momentum. Now a zero momentum cannot be achieved by one photon so two photons are required. Now the total energy afterwards therefore if there are two photons must be 2 hf where hf is the energy of a photon. So this is a very important idea because these two particles which have annihilated start off with a rest energy 
energy of E0. Now remember, this is important because they'll have the same rest energy and that will then turn into those the energy of the two photons 2HF. Now this effect takes place in a positron emission tomography scanner or PET scanner because a positron emitting isotope is administered to a patient. This isotope releases positrons, the positron travels a few millimeters and annihilates and so two gamma photons are emitted and detected by scanners which allows the scanner to build up an image of the interior of the body. So what's going on in terms of energy? So the total energy before is 2E0 where E0 is the rest energy. Now the total energy afterwards is 2HF so therefore the total energy before equals the total energy after because the total energy mass must remain constant so 2E0 equals 2HF the twos cancel through so therefore the minimum energy of each photon produced in annihilation is equal to HF or the rest energy of the original particle antiparticle which we can show in this particular diagram of annihilation. Now the opposite of annihilation is pair production. That is when matter is created from energy. It creates a pair of particles, the conventional particle and its antimatter particle. So a photon can turn into, into two particles, one of matter, one of antimatter. Now the photon must contain enough energy to form the rest mass of both particles. So that's a very, very important idea because this photon has an energy of HF, but the particle antiparticle each have a rest energy of E0. So that tells us that HF from the photon is equal to 2E0 because one photon is producing one particle, one antiparticle. So the energy required to produce these particles comes from the energy of the photon. Any extra above this is found as kinetic energy and this is needed again to stop the particles annihilated. But the minimum energy of a photon needed, which is HF minimum, is equal to 2E0. So if the photon does not have enough energy to produce the rest energy of the particles, then the process simply doesn't happen. This is why extremely massive particles are rare in our universe as it's rare to find photons of such high energy that can produce these particles via pair production. So let's just look at an example. The electron has a rest energy of 0.511 MeV. Therefore, for the pair production, an electron and positron form from a, phot from a photon. So you need double the photon energy because you need HF equals 2E0. So therefore, the minimum photon energy will be 2 times by 0.511 MeV, which is 1.022 MeV, which we convert into joules is 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. And a photon with less energy than 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules could not create a positron and an electron. Now it's important to note that you would always actually need slightly more energy than the particle rest energies to successfully carry out pair production because it gives the particle and antiparticle enough kinetic energy to overcome their attraction because any excess energy above the rest energy of the particles goes into the kinetic energy store of the particle antiparticle produced and this is needed because it stops annihilation occurring straight after pair production because as you'll be aware the particle antiparticle will have an attraction between each other so they need enough kinetic energy to escape this attraction now it's important to note like as we mentioned before that in a particle is not moving it has a rest mass and that's the minimum mass possible so this is the photon energy equal to the rest energies of both particles and if we only made the enough the um just the rest mass of the two particles then the particle and the particle would annihilate but if you produce slightly more energy Okay, in your photon, which is then turned into the mass and, um, of the particle antiparticle, then they would have enough energy to then escape this, um, this attraction between each other. So it's a very important idea that any excess energy goes into the kinetic energy of the particles to escape each other. Now the difference in pair production and annihilation leads to the following effect. So if we carry out annihilation, the annihilation of a particle antiparticle can lead to pair production. Then each photon produces its own particle and antiparticle. So each photon produced in annihilation goes off to produce its own particle and antiparticle. So this means the resultant particle and antiparticles produced from those photons produced in annihilation have a smaller mass than the previous particles as the starting energy is now spread between two photons. Now if those then annihilate with each other, well the two photons are produced in this case. So as a result, the, the, the photons produced will have half the energy of the previous 
these photons. So this means that with repeated annihilation and pair production, the energies become spread out over the universe and the possible particles produced via this process are less massive than what we started with. So this is the reason why energy is dissipated in the universe and the most common particles in our universe are the ones with the least mass, the proton, the neutron, the electron. Now this idea that energy spreads out across the universe and less mass, mass, mass of particles are produced is the concept of entropy. Entropy always increases in our universe. Energy always spreads out. So to compare and contrast the proper processes of prayer production and annihilation. In annihilation, you start with a particle antiparticle, you finish with two photons, and to work out the energy required, you know HF is equal to E0. But in pair production, you start with one photon, you finish with a particle and antiparticle, and then you have a minimum energy calculation of HF equals 2E0. So let's just summarize what we've learned in today's lesson. For every type of particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle, and you can should be able to compare the particle and antiparticle masses, charge, and rest energies. You should know that the positron, antiproton, antineutron, antineutrino are the antiparticles of the electron, proton, neutrino, and neutron, respectively. You should have knowledge of annihilation and pair production and the energies involved, and the use of E equals mc squared is not required, but you've got to understand that's the equation where it was all summarized from. So if we're being successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we can define what antimatter and antiparticles are. We can recall the properties of antimatter and antiparticles, and we can describe what happens when a particle and antiparticle meet. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson looking at particles and antiparticles in the particles and radiation section of AQA A-Level Physics. Thank you very much for listening, and have a lovely day.